Thank you for coming to tonight's uh, second web stream uh, of the uh, EGA live stream series. It's the second in a regular monthly webcast that will, if you want to find out more, the website is gardenstates.entheogenesis.org. Uh, and if you miss any URLs or any other information uh, while we're while we're streaming, our handy admins are in the comments section of this live uh, video, and we'll be dropping links in and are there to ask answer any questions as well. And uh, the Garden States event Friday. Uh, the 1st and Saturday, the 2nd of October, Friday being our Victorian public holiday, in case you still aren't familiar with Victoria having a public holiday in October. Um, that'll be our, our grand final day public holiday. I think it will. Anyway, geez, I should check that, because isn't it end of September usually? Somebody grab a calendar and drop that in the in the comments section for me, please. Find out. Um, it's a forum for cultivating ethnobotanical plants, knowledge and community featuring Keeper Trout, Bruce Pascoe, Margaret Ross, Janet Lawrence, David Holmgren, Alison Pulio, uh, Suresh, uh, Suresh and Dr. Martin Williams. Uh, so for tonight's show... Uh, for tonight's show, hi everybody, my name's Nick uh, and I'll be hosting tonight's show uh, and on tonight's show we have two uh, special guests uh, our first special guest who we'll be hearing from shortly is Tom Forrest uh, Tom's going to uh, be talking to us about uh, cannabis agronomy or cultivation, agronomy, that's a much better word uh, and then later on we'll be hearing from Liam Engel uh, and we've also got a, um, an outtake from Sam Cutler uh, and also from the Seedlings Project, uh, which you can participate in too uh, at the Entheogenesis Australis website. So just head to the website and you can find out more about the Seedlings Project, which is taking uh, community input uh, and community videos, which we screen during these uh, webcasts. So we'll have another one of those tonight. But right now, I want to introduce our first guest, uh, Tom Forrest. Tom is an Australian agronomist working in the protected uh, cropping industry. Uh, Tom has instigated and consulted uh, to multiple successful cannabis, uh, cannabis projects and co-founded Indicated Technology, which also provides agricultural equipment, procurement services to licensed cultivators throughout the Asia-Pacific region and multiple LPs in Canada. Tom and his team have designed and supplied cultivation sites, including uh, for the World Health Organization partner universities, PC2 compliant research facilities, outdoor cannabis farms, and glasshouse projects. Tom, welcome. Oh, hello. Sorry, you just uh, caught me there reading my Entheogenesis Australis journal from 2017. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and an absolute honor to be a part of the entheogenesis community. So I guess I'll give a little bit of an introduction, uh, a little bit more than the introduction that's already happened. Um, well, my name is Tom Forrest. Uh, uh, I'm a Churchill Fellow and a cannabis enthusiast and agronomist. I've been working in the protected cropping space for around uh, a little over seven years now. And more recently, I've helped co-found a cannabis supply and consulting company in Australia. And we're also, uh, we've helped set up a, the largest cannabis project in New Zealand, in Puro, New Zealand. Uh, in 2019, I was fortunate enough to travel on a Churchill Fellowship. And I visited more than 50 different cannabis cultivation facilities around the world in 10 different countries over four months. And it was a, a real privilege to travel on behalf of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, the first fellowship for cannabis agronomy, and visit and film and look inside some facilities that have traditionally been closed door operations. And that, that's what we're going to show here today is a, a little short film that I made with the help of some guys at Mycelium Studios. And it just gives a bit of an insight as to what's happening in the world of cannabis agronomy and the cannabis community as a whole. So I really hope you enjoy it. And thank you again to Entheogenesis Australis for having me. I'm truly honoured. And that was uh, our video from Tom Forrest, who is sitting across from me on our Q&A panel now. So if you do have a question, please do drop it in the comments. Uh, now, Tom, we've got some questions coming through in the comments section. Our first one, uh, let's uh, go first to the issue of supply. Uh, cannabis supply, uh, apparently, uh, from what I understand, we have magnificent um, uh, temperature, magnificent um, uh, 
just general area for growing cannabis, but um, a lot of the supply is not necessarily coming from Australia. So Shana has asked, uh, when will we have supply, uh, a, a consistent supply so that we don't have to rely on Canada uh, and uh, have the associated high costs as well? It is, um, that is a really good question. Uh, and the other little factor that you missed out there is we also have a fantastic collection of farmers across Australia with really uh, very good skill sets across our uh, agronomic space. But in answer to your question, there, there are a limited number of cultivators operational in Australia. Um, there are, as far as I'm aware, two or three groups now producing Australian flour that is being sold to market. Uh, there's one group in Armadale, New South Wales, one group over in Western Australia. Sadly, they're, they're not able to meet demand. Um, and it is a point where we are still importing a significant amount of product from Canada. I don't know how quickly this will progress. In honesty, there's so many delays from the federal government, the Office of Drug Control. You're looking at anywhere between two to three years for a federal license to cultivate, to be issued, and that's a license and then permitting process. Uh, so it, it is delays at a bureaucratic level and they're making it extremely hard for groups to start cultivating, find genetics, go through the fit and proper persons testing. Uh, there's, there's a lot of acronyms and requirements and essentially paper hoops that people have to jump through to get to that stage. We do have an incredible agricultural sector and even across from the hemp sector, we have a lot of passionate cannabis farmers currently operating under hemp licences but they're not able to use that product to cater to the medicinal market. So I don't know how quickly this will progress. I know there has been revisions and appeals from different groups across Australia and groups in New Zealand actively working to supply and cater to this demand. Uh, there are a number of different farms, I believe more than a dozen farms coming online this year. So it is happening, uh, but it is slow and tedious and tied up with federal red tape. And it's, it's sad to see a lot of groups are kind of uh, looking at this as a, an economic benefit and saying, look, we can cater to this demand. How good is that for our shareholders and our, our market share? And they're ignoring the fact that patients were able to get a product that may have worked for them. They may have got the product from Australian suppliers. And then all of a sudden the doctor can't prescribe that anymore. And they're going back to black market or gray market suppliers. So yeah, it, it is a problem that we're not self-sufficient, but there are a lot of groups both with the right intentions and with capitalist intentions trying to cater to that market so hopefully this year we see more products coming online but that's a really good question thank you for asking a uh, question from Darklight in the comments section and please keep those questions coming uh well now uh, cannabis polyploid do you know of a difference in meta uh, metabolic outcomes for offspring if a tetraploid parent uh, parent donor is male when compared to female tetraploid donor she's doing this to tongue twist me but i think i got there <laughs> and that's, that's actually really fascinating because i was discussing this over the last few days we've had a few big discussions with a couple of groups that i'm involved with about the uh, fasciation as a symptom of polyploidism, the potential for triploid and uh, polyploid genetics to be utilised for enhanced vigour or potential potency, but then also research being done on polyploidism to have adverse effects and potential less potency or less floral development or inconsistent floral development causing um, mould and botrytis problems. So and, and that's a huge question to get into, especially at 8.30 on a Wednesday night. So I'll, if you, I'll jump into the comment section and get back to you with some links on this. I'll send you over some data of some studies that we've been looking at into recently, but thanks for uh, just going right into the deep end there. <laughs> I'd love, love to have a bit more banter with that person. Just for my own sake, what, just a, a quick definition of what a polyploid and a tetraploid are, just so I don't feel entirely lost. Two sets of chromosomes, normal is diploid, and then you have triploid where you have three sets and then polyploid essentially is multiple sets of chromosomes. So as far as I know, there's people now that have put it to octuploid. The uh, Oregon Seed Company have published some data about what happens when you make an octuploid, I'm probably saying that wrong, uh, cannabis cultivar. And at that point, it's, it's unstable. It turns into this little mutant, like freaky looking thing. Um, but yeah, essentially a little bit of a genetic mutation and it can cause different symptoms, both positive or negative. 
And then when you start crossing that back in from male and female, you can have different results again. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhere that a lot of people in the cannabis space are actively looking into and seeing exactly how far we can push the cannabis genome and what sort of different freaky freaks can have benefit. Genetics, got it. Thank you. Uh, question from Ellen. Uh, what sort of public policies do you think that we need to lobby for in Australia to make sure that the industry is fair to farmers uh, and uh, to traditional or underground growers? That's a, that's a fantastic question. So right now we have restrictions on fit and proper persons testing. If you have any relation to anyone that's ever had issues with cannabis crime, then you're almost immediately eliminated from working in the legitimate cannabis sector. Uh, we have requirements on business uh, structure and you have to be able to prove that you have certain amounts of money in a bank account. You have to really show that you're almost a, a public company that's funded by the pharmaceutical space and has ties with an offtake group in Germany to be able to operate in the cannabis space. So there's, there's, from the outset, we've almost eliminated the, the, the cannabis community that exists, uh, both in the grey and illicit market. So moving forward, I think there needs to be a real focus on decriminalisation as opposed to legalisation for medical purposes. There needs to be uh, an acknowledgement that we have a community here looking up. And I, I was raised around the Northern Rivers and I, I know there's some phenomenal growers, breeders and cannabis activists up in that region that really should be acknowledged for their work instead of being hung out to dry by our current legal system. So removing these stringent security requirements, treating cannabis like a non-dangerous plant, the whole concept of a dangerous plant when you can grow poppies in Tasmania barely behind a barbed wire fence with morphine and theobromine and people have had problems with this plant in the past. And yet if you want to set up a cannabis cultivation facility in Tasmania, you're looking at dual fencing with cyclone fencing, uh, off-site and on-site security, uh, razor wire and cameras everywhere. It's almost comical when you see these cannabis facilities next door to the poppy farms and you have to consider which one has more potential for harm. So I guess the, the big educational factor is talking about it with your GP, talking about it with your local MPs, with your friends, with your politicians, with your family, and explain to them, like, this isn't a dangerous plant. We have no potential for harm. There's no cannabis overdoses or any potential overdose usually results in a run to the fridge and a, a quick nap. But there's, yeah, it just comes down to explaining to people that the medical benefits of this plant is just the tip of the iceberg. We, we have nutraceutical, we have cosmetic, we have health and wellness, we have food and beverage potential. And then we have the benefit of just having a plant that we have access to outside of the active pharmaceutical ingredients this, the cannabis plant has potential to influence a whole number of sectors, but right now it's still a dangerous plant and that's what we have to move past and just throw away some of the prohibitionist dogma that we've had generations of people have been subject to. Uh, this question from Yellow Submarine uh, asking about uh, CBD uh, and when we might be able to see uh, access to CBD products uh, in pharmacies or stores. Um, so I'm actually not up to date with uh, the, the legal status. I know that it's all over the place uh, under the TGA schedules because that's how the TGA works. Um, but do you have any idea on um, when we might see access to uh, CBD uh, containing products Um yeah. It, it almost feels like your audience knows me there's some you're hitting the ones that are almost like peter griffin you know how to grind my gears uh this one's a frustrating one so you've got the tga uh making these announcements and all the big cannabis companies using this as leverage for their public listings and saying tga is going to be available over the counter at pharmacies where rescheduling and you'll be able to buy uh oh sorry cbd is it will be available over the counter and these CBD products can be, I think, up to 160 milligrams per milliliter. So there's enough for efficacy there. And everyone's like, cool, CBD available without a prescription. That's fantastic. And then you look at the fine print and it has to be on the ARTG, the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. To get a product onto the ARTG requires significant clinical trial data, which requires money, time, effort and energy that only a very small handful of companies can afford. And currently there is none. So although all these big, big cannabis companies are making a 
big kerfuffle about the fact that we've got CBD available over the counter in pharmacies. It, it doesn't exist right now. CBD is, is about as harmful as fish oil, but with less damage to the environment. We need to look to countries like the UK, our Commonwealth parent over there. They have CBD available in health food shops. It's on the aisle in Tesco's next to the fish oil products. It's a, it's a supplement, and yet we're still treating it like a scheduled drug. So it's a step in the right direction. Don't get me wrong that the TGA is doing the right thing by lowering the scheduling but it's only an interim step. It needs to be completely descheduled. CBD needs to be treated like a nutraceutical, a novel food product at best. And when that will happen, I guess, is that's up to the political gods at this stage. Mm, keeping themselves busy at the moment. Uh, the, another tongue twister mm. from, uh, from Dark Light. Um, how do the new uh, fungal bioelicitors and microbial uh, pathogen killers get past QA levels for mould? Again, no idea what's being asked here, but pull it apart for us, Tom. I think what Dark Light is talking about here is um, a lot of the products uh, on the worldwide market uh, testing positive for uh, levels of aflatoxins, mycotoxins. So essentially uh, fungi poop uh, is the, the short version of what aflatoxins and mycotoxins are, and also for moulds and yeast. And part of the standard for cannabis, the TGO93, which is the standard uh, set forward by the TGA for medicinal cannabis products, is there's certain thresholds designed for acceptable levels of aflatoxins, mycotoxins, moulds and yeasts. Um, I guess a lot of the product, and I can't speculate on who or where it's coming from, um, but a lot of the product is irradiated. This is one of the, the dirty secrets of the cannabis space, particularly in Canada. It's estimated more than 95% of product uh, coming from Canadian licensed producers is irradiated, so essentially microwaved, and that gets rid of uh, a portion of these aflatoxins and mycotoxins. There are groups claiming that their product does not require irradiation. Uh, and there's some other different groups coming out with uh, vacuum drying and irradiating techniques that are supposedly less harmful. But the frustrating part about that is when we irradiate products, which is commonly done in the food industry, we degrade certain compounds. So it's if you think about it broadly, you put a cannabis flower in the microwave, uh, it's not going to be as good when it comes out. You're going to have degradation of active ingredients and of terpenes and flavonoids, the, the flavours and smells of cannabis. So it's a bit of a Band-Aid solution. We need to be able to grow, develop varieties, cultivars, strains, whatever you want to call them, that are tolerant to pest and disease and can be grown in slightly adverse conditions without having things like powdery mildew or botrytis. Uh, right now the breeding is still in its infancy. It's a toddler walking around. It's, it doesn't... Cannabis breeding has a long way to go. Then we need to design facilities and cultivation methods that aren't conducive to these different uh, pests, diseases, molds, aflatoxins, mycotoxin issues. And then we need to put all that together so we can grow a flower that doesn't require irradiation or any further treatment. And that's, that's something a lot of people in the cannabis space are working towards, but it's still, it's a, it's a big challenge. And most of your big LPs and without naming names, most of the big LPs and some of the ones that I visited uh, have to go through this process. And it's, it's, it's sad because you're getting a product that's not as good as it should have been and doesn't potentially have the medical efficacy that it should have. So I think that's what you're asking there, but I, I definitely want to have more conversations with you in the outside of the interwebs because that sounds like uh, we'd have some pretty good banter. Yeah, yeah, uh, Darklight has appreciated your answer in the comments section. Do keep those uh, questions coming through. Uh, this one from a friend of EGA from uh, PRISM Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine, uh, their website prism.org.au, from the Vice President, Dr Stephen Bright, uh, asking if you've got any uh, advice uh, that the psychedelics field could use uh, from the cannabis industry. Is there anything that you could transpose across uh, for the emergent psychedelic industry or, or perhaps perhaps um, things to, to watch out for, any, any lessons learned? I think from what I can see from the outside looking into the, the psychedelic space and especially in the sort of medicinal application of psychedelics, is it's already starting to happen. And my point there is we're looking at it starts with the universities, getting postgrad scientists and researchers to publish papers, getting those papers acknowledged by the wider community, 
and sharing those papers as far and wide as we can, having that dispersed amongst the, the greater community outside of the academic space. It's often said there's there's not enough research on cannabis and it's the same with psychedelics. It's not enough research on psilocybin, but it's not true. We have researchers around the world that are doing this pivotal work and proving these claims with irrefutable scientific data and peer-reviewed reporting. And that's what I think needs to continue to happen. Partner up with the big universities, work with multiple groups um, around the world, and that's where it starts. The universities will pioneer something. And, of course, corporate companies will try to capitalise that as a financial gain. But the main thing is we get that information being published by the university research field, and, and then we can acknowledge the fact that we're, we're not crazy hippies. We're, <laughs> we've been onto something for quite some time now. Absolutely. Um, any more uh, questions, please do drop them in the uh, comments section. Uh, I, there is one here, um, but I'm actually, um, I'll, I'll sort of answer this one. I'm not sure you might have something to add to this, Tom, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll put it to you. Um, but Ben is wondering uh, who in the political space is making headway towards removing red tape for cannabis production, any people you could point towards uh, or who could use support. And just in the comment section, I will drop a link uh, for people here in Victoria. Uh, there's currently an inquiry into uh, a broad ranging uh, use of cannabis so this includes uh, recreational if you want to use that term I'm not sure it, that's always the right term but uh, it is a, a broad ranging inquiry and they are having hearings at Victorian Parliament tomorrow uh, which is chaired by uh, Fiona Patton from uh, the Reason Party in a Northern Metro uh, member for the Legislative Council as well um, and uh, just a few years ago as well in 2018 uh, there was a, a wide ranging inquiry into drug law reform that was tabled which had a entire section, a, a, a lot of pages dedicated to uh, cannabis, both recreational and uh, medicinal. Um, so I highly recommend checking out those reports. Um, but Tom, if you wanted to add anything as well. I guess uh, we had a little bit of a conversation about this one today, about uh, Fiona being involved and she has been a, a strong advocate for the, the cannabis space in general, both medicinal uh, and recreational adult use, or so going to the different terms for that. Um, and Fiona is a superstar. She's a lovely lady and very outspoken, and that's essentially what's needed. The other one, I guess, is uh, I believe his name is Michael Peterson, who put forward the original uh, uh, the bill to allow two plant home cultivation in the ACT, and that's currently operational. We've had more than 12 months now where people by state law have been legally allowed to grow two plants in their own backyard. There is some funny little caveats on the, the size of the plant and the harvesting and drying process and the certain weights that you can have on hand. So you, you legally can't grow two giant trees, although I know a lot of people see the two plant green light and see how big they can push that friendship. But it is, um, yeah, no adverse responses have been recorded. There was an article in the ABC recently that said 12 months on what's happened since we allowed people to grow cannabis and no increases in crime, no the, the pigs went flying, no sky fell in, um, even, I believe, no increases in drug-related problems in hospital or driving. It actually just, yeah, it's it, it was 100% successful. So I believe that's a really good uh, example to look at. And I'm, I'm hoping there's more politicians that have, I guess, the, the guts to stand up and say, look, we can do something similar. And then that hopefully will lead to a functional cannabis marketplace, both for adult use or moving into nutraceutical cosmetics, food, beverage, and wellness. Uh, all of these sectors have the potential benefit to raise income and or stimulate the economy in every single state. So that's what I guess we're looking to. And Michael Peterson is one of those guys. He's a young dude who he did it. And I'm super stoked that he did. Yep, the ACT, uh, progressive uh, home of federal politics, um, which is a funny thing to say sometimes. Uh, and it's Michael uh, Peterson, I believe, because we did I did speak to him um, a little while ago, and I think it's Dutch or something his last name. So there's a double T and a double S in there. But I'll drop in uh, his name into uh, into the comments for anybody who is in the ACT or has friends or colleagues in the ACT, um, because they've definitely been a good uh, uh, testing ground, I suppose, for these policies. Um, we haven't got any 
many more questions uh, in the comments. So maybe just a final one uh, for you, Tom, uh, and then we'll move on to our uh, next segment. Um, but do you think it's uh, more important for the cannabis community to focus on decriminalization or medicalization? So just a broad uh, summary from you. <laughs> That's that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess what, taking one quick step back, Michael Pedersen, if he's got Dutch pedigree, then he's probably quite good at gardening as well. So I'm, I'm glad he's the guy putting <laughs> is uh, putting the bill forward. But yeah, that, that's a big question. And I guess in my mind, the, the medicalization of cannabis based on what we've seen around the world is the Trojan horse for decriminalization or legalization. Uh, in Canada, there is still an issue with, as, as you saw in the film, of fake legalization. It's it's allowed and there's a recreational market, but there's also real problems with who can grow it, who can consume it, where you can consume it and who can sell it. And it's not quite there. There's still a level of, of decriminalization required. Um, I believe the, the medical sector has the ability to prove that it's not a dangerous plant and it, it changes the mindset of the sort of I guess the older generation that have been subject to so much prohibitionist dogma, these groups really need to see that it's not a dangerous plant. It's not going to make you listen to jazz music and have sex with black men like some of the old uh, reefer madness films used to insinuate. It's, it's now at a point where the medicinal space is proving that this plant has benefit to the people that need it most. So the guys that are most anti-cannabis are the ones that really stand to benefit from it the most. And that's where I think we can learn from that and that will allow them to generally accept like, oh, cool, this isn't so dangerous. And I think there's, there's always going to be a certain sector of the community that doesn't agree with the medicinal movement or with the different aspects of legalisation. And it's at a point now where I think... <clears throat> I guess it's a really hard one to answer. <laughs> I like the legalization. I like that it allows this to happen, but I do really want to see decriminalization in the not too distant future. I think that's has to be the end goal. That's the goalposts and legalization is just a player on the field getting us towards that. So yeah, long winded answer to go into, but the, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big question to ask a quarter to nine. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's it's an ongoing thing, and this is about the uh, part of uh, any presentation like this that I recommend um, that you do get involved with these conversations because the way that these things change is by keeping the momentum in these conversations. So by speaking to your members of parliament, um, by becoming part of uh, of groups, signing petitions, um, and and just keeping yourself um, knowledgeable about these things, which I know can be difficult at times because there is so much information out there, especially the cannabis play, uh, space has exploded. Uh, I mean, now uh, the question about psychedelics earlier, even that space has exploded. So much information out there. I think a lot of it is noise. So you can find ways to focus on um, things uh, that really matter, especially if you've got a particular interest, whether it be in agronomy and uh, hearing from somebody like Tom or in policy and finding out about the uh, policy changes that are going on. Uh, there are ways that you can get get involved and stay informed. So I um, want to just say thank you very much to uh, Tom Forrest for joining us tonight and uh, and the wonderful video as well. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure and really fun to chat. Uh, and a reminder, Garden States is our in-person event currently scheduled for Friday the 1st and Saturday the 2nd uh, of October. Uh, it is a full two days of ethnobotanical knowledge sharing on plants, fungi and the environment, uh, exploring the relationships between humankind and plants, including gardening, conservation and sustainability, culture, art, spirituality, philosophy, research and politics. That covers about all of it. Garden States is designed to encourage community building around medicinal plants, research and psychedelic culture. Get your hands dirty and learn from the experts on how to grow and share ethnobotanical plants. Participate in the community-led learning and meet like-minded botanical folk from across Australia. This is the Entheogenesis Australis web stream. <laughs>